do my job search and I, and I ask, well, what kind of work are you looking for? And they say, well, it doesn't really matter. I'll do anything, but can you just look at my resume? And, and that whole logic today doesn't work. Um, you really have to know what it is you want to do um, and spend the time figuring that out before you can write a resume. That's been my sort of the, big the, thing. The lack of focus. Um, is that, no focus, yeah. Yeah, the lack of focus. That echoes with everybody pretty much, right? The, the idea yes, that certainly. there's a lack of focus. Uh, a focused resume definitely is much more effective than a, a unfocused resume. Well, the idea is still, it's unbelievable to me that people are still, um, we can list them off. They're copying and pasting from uh, job descriptions. They're actually entities uh, that serve uh, certain niches that actually encourage uh, this behavior. <laughs> I, can I just say one other thing? I saw a recruiter, a woman who says she's a recruiter and she also does resume writing. And uh -huh. she said, little tip here, folks, copy and paste the entire job description, uh -huh. post it at the bottom of your resume and make the font white. Who does that? Like the no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's an easy way to, um, especially if you're just applying through job boards, it's, it's, it's a, it's a peril. Uh, I want to advice. piggyback off of what Hannah said. And I think this is important. So obviously I write resumes and I value them. I think having a good strategic document is so important, but you actually made a post um, recently, Hannah, on LinkedIn about the value of a job search strategy plan. And so many people think the resume is the answer and the resume is going to get them a job, but the resume is really just a strategic marketing document that you use to get the job. And so you have to have a well executed plan in order to get your resume in the hands of the right people. And so I think that's a really big step that some people miss. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Sarah just contributed. Um, Part of being strategic is knowing where you want to apply. So not only having a targeted resume, but I like to have my clients start with a target companies. This is one of the very first things I go over with my clients. Um, I like to you know, ask them, where do you love to work? Um, what companies have you had your eye on, been a fan of you know, for a few years, let's say, and you want to start building that list. And so when it comes down to actually writing your resume, you have perhaps a more finite group of companies you're targeting that's less customization across the board. And uh, to Hannah's point, then you can really you know, dive in and heavily customize that document to target it at the needs, the gaps, and the challenges that a particular company is facing. And so it's one of the best tactics or strategies you can take to having a more successful job search. And as Sarah's saying, getting your resume into the right hands with that strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think people, uh, uh, we have so many more tools now than we did back in 2010 when I first started, because we, back then, this is still a good uh, strategy is to be able to use a word cloud, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to take your resume, paste it to see what words are emphasized. Then came JobScan mm -hmm. with their tool, uh, which allows us to, uh, you can upload your resume, upload the job description, and you can do a side-by-side -side comparison practically. Right. Mm -hmm. So that makes it much more effective. But there are other tools, too, if I'm forgetting them. But I think that's the one I refer people to often is the job scan tool. Yeah, thumbs up to job scan. I think yeah. it, it just helps make that process of identifying important words so crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. I'll and add, though, go that ahead. I, I love job scan and I think it's a really great tool. But if someone's new to using it, you don't need to strive to get 100 percent. Like I have never had a resume get 100%. Right. It's, it's really a guide and you want to make sure that you're using it to identify words that you may be missing and you don't necessarily need to have all the, the, the words that they're suggesting. Right. 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 So let's oh, talk about the other tool that people are, are confused about mm -hmm. is LinkedIn because I've heard people tell me, I'm on LinkedIn, I have a profile, but nobody's hiring me. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's not really how LinkedIn works. So, right. yeah, keyword usage is underutilized still and still underserved as far as that being a part of the discussion, which people think that you just write a resume and you write a profile, and then boom, people will, uh, employees will magically see you with a halo on top of your head. You said, This is the one I need to hire. And it doesn't work that way. 
I Even see a lot of job seekers lose their job and immediately change their headline to seeking employment or seeking new opportunities. And the thing is, is you're missing out on keyword optimization. Recruiters are not looking for a supply chain executive by using the search term seeking new opportunities. They're searching for Lean Six Sigma or supply mm -hmm. chain executives. So make sure that you're using the words that somebody would actually search for. Mm -hmm. Right. I, what I, when I work with clients, so one of the things I really, really um, stress is doing competitive research mm -hmm. um, amongst you know, the, the, your peers within your industry. So for example, um, if you are you know, uh, a marketing manager and you want to get to a director of marketing position, it might do you very well to you know, look up, to search using the people search function, mm -hmm. uh, director of marketing, and see who pops up on the first one or two pages of results and examine their profiles. How are they positioning themselves with their headline? How are they writing their summaries? What are the key skills of listing their skills in the endorsement section? And you try to glean from them and pull from them. What is making them pull, you know, appear on page one of their results? And you can take those elements of their profiles that are, are successful and that resonate with you and of course skills that you have. <laughs> we don't want you fudging data on your, on your uh, profiles, but if these are skills and abilities you have, add them to your profile, you're gonna boost your keyword richness and it'll be easier for you to be found on LinkedIn. I'm sure many of you will, will attest this, you have to be active on LinkedIn as well, which I believe what, uh, what Hannah was getting at. So I love to hear you talk about what activity on LinkedIn might even look like. Right, uh, I think that, um, you know, and, and you're not at, at all advocating copying and pasting. Oh no, definitely not, <laughs> not copying and pasting. You're, but but you're, you're seeing how that person positions himself Mm -hmm. and, yeah, him and that you're able to and actually you can upload that person's LinkedIn profile to see what kind of keywords are, are, are you know uh, dominate or uh, draw people to uh, or what recruiters may be drawn to with their profile and then think how that applies to your career and exactly. not mimic someone else's I actually yeah. had a client once who actually says I want her I want my profile to look like hers. I said, um, <laughs> that's not going to work real well. Right. Because you don't have her credentials. For mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's really it, hard. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. We could start right there and that it just go out, just went downhill. But uh, I think those elements are really important. So really, we, so that kind of brings on to the discussion too, is that now is there a, it even grayer line or maybe even a wider line depending on how you look at it, between a resume and LinkedIn they're two different things really uh, right. I mean I think that there's some overlap but I think that if you're looking if you're thinking about it, this is just my take and I'd love to hear what you guys think too because right. as I sort of think about it there's a difference the resume is a piece of paper that you're submitting when there's a job posting mm -hmm. so it's it's that sort of response to the job posting and it's highly customized to show that you have the experience that they're looking for the linkedin profile is online content it is a personal portfolio it is you and everything a about you, the good, the bad, the relevant, the not so relevant. I mean, there's probably not as much of that, but it really is a living, breathing online piece of content. Which but it doesn't become, it doesn't really become a portfolio either until you, you make it one. To, in, until you start to show some samples of what. Well, you, that's what I want people to do. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, and it should and you, be a portfolio. And, and I think you said that at least once a week for the past eight weeks now <laughs> that, uh, that, yeah, you need to show your work. You need to show uh, yeah. portfolios. And these, it tells me what kind of work you do. Right. But without it, it's no longer, uh, uh, it's just a presence. It's not a portfolio. And I'll add to what Peter yeah. said. I heard um, William Aruda say that your LinkedIn profile is often your digital first impression. So before you go to a networking meeting in person, you often go online and you Google someone and you find their LinkedIn page and you read about them and you learn more about them before you meet them in person. I, when I write summaries for clients, I often write them in the first person and think of it as they're going to a networking event. They're meeting the most important person at the party. What would they say to them? What would their story be if they met someone at an event? And that's what your summary statement should be. It should be your who, your what, your why, and keywords. Right. Yes. I, I, Go oh, ahead. I think of it as being, in essence, your professional personality. 
um, I think it's really a chance to showcase, you know, who you are, not just your skill set, but also what you believe in. Uh, so, you know, to Sarah's point, you know, this is about talking the first person. It's about stating what you believe, stating what your interests are, stating what your passions are, not necessarily using that word because we all use it, but making it very clear, you know, what it is it, that is your animating force, right? Mm -hmm. And that will give people the opportunity to be attracted to that animating force if you are true and genuine in how you communicate it through your profile. So whether that's working with one of us to help you write it or taking a stab at it yourself, try, you want to leave what impression you want people to have after they read your profile. And if you start with that end in mind, it'll help you really, you know, deliver a really strong presentation of yourself, you know, as your first impression, people click on your LinkedIn profile. That's a competing force, I think. Uh, you, two, you really hit the nail hard on this one in mentioning personality. I think there's a lot of data that's often given by people but there's not enough personality to go along with the data. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, the recruiter, what, they're not going, they're going to look for, you know, they're going to do cold searches, but most people, especially employers are not going to know who you are till they get a resume and that they're considering you. And that really, isn't it sort of like if I have two LinkedIn profiles and one that has more personality than the other one, mm -hmm. I'm going to feel more comfortable in wanting to talk to that person a little bit more. Right. Everybody agrees? Uh, absolutely. Definitely. And Sarah, do you do storytelling? Can you, t can you talk a little bit about the value of storytelling? Because that's such a huge thing in today's market. Absolutely. Yeah. I think people resonate and connect when you tell a story. It, it's different than if you just state the facts. If you like, you could state that you did X, Y, and Z, but if you capture people's attention with a story, they're going to click because LinkedIn only shows you three sentences of a summary statement. You have to actually click to read more. So if you start with a hook, something that's engaging, they're going to want to click to read more about you. They're going to be more engrossed in who you are, and they're going to be more connected to you as a person. So I think stories are so powerful. Stories are very powerful and actually it engages people a whole lot more when you are telling something that has a climax and even sometimes that may even have um, an antagonist and a protagonist in a sense. Maybe mm -hmm. you're not making a single person a protagonist, but the, a circumstance can be a, 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 an antagonist and that you're trying, that you're, that you're the hero. Uh, in that particular story. And that's sort of the, the essence of it all, shouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. And yeah, marketing, I, and folks in marketing are really focused on storytelling because people will remember stories. We're hardwired to remember stories because they evoke emotion, all the other wonderful things Sarah said. So stories are so powerful. And I think we're afraid, we've been conditioned over the course of our careers that the job search is strictly, you know, this black and white kind of resume stuff. But it's more than that because people hire people. Yes, absolutely. So, Sarah, uh, let's move to the section where we talk about some of the best tactical and strategic moves. Uh, if you can name something that really is that you've seen that's really worked uh, in 2019, and, and and if you see it evolving in 2020, what would that strategy be? The most common mistake, I'll start with a mistake first. The most common mistake I hear people say is, oh, I've applied for 200 jobs online and nobody's calling me back. I'm so depressed. It, and the reason that this is, this is a, I don't want to use the word fruitless, but an effort that is not, it doesn't pr produce as much fruit as is the method I'm about to talk about is that applicant tracking systems have changed the way that the job search occurs. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago when I was recruiting, we would have a position that we'd post and we'd maybe get 20 applicants for that role. In today's time, because applicant tracking systems have made it so easy to apply for jobs and have made um, job postings accessible to so many, um, you may get 150 applicants to that same job that we got 20 applicants to 10 years ago. So the competition for roles is so much greater. And if you're just applying for jobs online, you're gonna not feel successful and it's gonna take you longer. Where I see job seekers in today, 2019, having success is building out targeted lists like Niatu mentioned earlier. Asking yourself, where would I actually like to work and who hires people like me? 
and creating that target list of, I like to say 25 to 35. And it, and de it depends on your industry. You may be in a really niche industry where mm -hmm. there may be only 10 companies that hire people like you, but 25 to 35 target companies, and then taking it a step further and building out two separate lists. Who can I meet with who can make some introductions for me? And who works at this these target companies who would potentially be my boss? And LinkedIn is such a great tool in today's time for finding those target people and doing that target research. I like to say that um, old school skills are new school. And so whereas you know, everybody's going to AI and talking about AI, I think there's a lot of value in old school networking and just having face-to-face -face conversations with people. Absolutely, and I think um, it's a problem that's uh, been, it's interesting, you put so much content out there, you see so much content in not doing that, but mm -hmm. people don't are, are always looking for something that's easy. Mm -hmm. And it's just easy to blindly uh, apply and to send people. And, and again, you hope for the halo effect. You hope that somebody sees your name and they get this revelation that you're the one. <laughs> and and it, it, it doesn't work that way because you, you know what? There's, there's a, a ton of people who are doing the same as you are. And that doesn't help you stand out at all. Mm -hmm. uh, any more thoughts on that one? Uh, just jumping off that last point about, you know, a lot of people who are doing what you do um, and just looping back in the storytelling point, I think uh, whether it's 2019, 2020 or going forward, it's about being very clear about who you are and what your unique value is. That's never going to go out of style. Um, I really like to help my clients establish you know, what their truths are, uh, for lack of a better word. So what's true about um, your, your value offer? What is that you do differently or better or uniquely than other people in your very same function? Uh, you could have two uh, sales, sales clients are one of my favorites to work with um, because they are always dead set on using their numbers. And yes, the numbers are really, really important. Mm -hmm. However, if you're competing at a certain level of job, you and the other people have relatively similar numbers. You're all overachieving your targets. You're all you know, beating your quota and so on and so forth. And so the difference is how did you go about it versus how the other person went about it? Did you have a new strategy, a new tactic? Are you really good at developing your sales team and your awesome trainer and you, you, you elevated their level that elevated everyone's level? So you have to find out what is it that was unique about your approach that you can bring an offer to a new employer that's gonna stand you apart from sales who may have very, very similar performance numbers. And so that story, the context around how you overachieved, uh, the antagonist being the situation, as you said, Mark. Um, that's a great way, whether on a resume, on a LinkedIn, or in person, an interview, to deliver, you know, your, your differentiating factors to your competition and stand out, you know, and so really uh, going forward, know your value offer, know differentiating factors, and know how to articulate it in your marketing materials and in person. Great job. Thank you. Hannah, how about you? What are, what is uh, the, the, uh, best tactical uh, strategy you've advised? Yeah, I, I love the idea. Um, Niato and Sarah have talked about the, the target list. And, and I think that, that that is really the driving factor for everything that they're going to be doing from the networking to the applying for jobs and, and the information gathering and the, the gaining intelligence so that you're going to be able to be present what it is the marketplace is looking for. It just drives so much. If you have, you have to have targets. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've been saying this for probably the whole time <laughs> I've been doing this, but it just really is so important because it, it opens the doors. If you can network your way into a job, that is mm -hmm. one of the best ways to stand above and beyond anybody else. Well, Hannah, you've been doing this for, for a while, and, and I'm sure that you've seen people get jobs created for them that weren't posted to begin with. Right. You know, like I, I often see with my clients where they are high performers, they're, they're well-liked, they've got great reputations, and, and maybe they lose their job and it feels hopeless. They meet with their network, they meet with their target companies, and jobs just kind of happen out of thin air that, that maybe would not have happened if they, haven't they didn't leverage their networks. Yeah, 
And I think, to, so Niato, you might be able to relate to this too. When mm -hmm. you're driving your job search because you've got a list of target companies and you're not just relying on the posted jobs, it puts you mentally in a much better position than feeling like you're at the whim of bad jobs, there are no jobs posted, and nobody's getting back to me. This, this process of developing and driving your job search is really empowering, have you found? Yes, certainly. I think that one of the biggest challenges job seekers face from an emotional standpoint in jobs are just feeling overwhelmed. If your first action is to log onto a job board and type in, you know, job title X, you're going to have maybe hundreds of hits depending on what it is that you do. And so that's just a lot mentally to take in. By, you know, managing the pool of targets, uh, you are empowering yourself to be able to have greater focus better prioritize your time and you're not chasing you know 80 targets because you send your resume 80 places mm -hmm. um and in addition uh with the networking piece uh, to you know to sarah and hannah's point you can all i like to tell my clients you can empower your network if you send an email to your network saying hey guys i'm looking at these 10 particular companies do you know anyone that's way more actionable for your own network versus hey network I'm looking for a job. And then they say, well, okay, what do I do with that? Um, so you can be much more directive and help people help you um, if you have that target focus list. And emotionally, you know, again, that's the, the key piece. Um, you have greater peace of mind because you have, you've chosen your targets. They're not choosing you. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. I'm going to say a little thing that um, I recommend people use email over LinkedIn in mail or a LinkedIn messaging, mm -hmm. because I, I just think that LinkedIn messaging is messy. Um, and people don't that are working that are not looking for jobs are not really living on LinkedIn. So that message is not going to get seen. But we know that everybody is checking email. So if you're given the choice or chance to email somebody or send a message through LinkedIn, always use email. It depends if that person's email is, is uh, server is useful. I know there's there sometimes there are people using like the old email services, right. where you know like Yahoo, AOL, or you know, AOL. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but all but even some of the newer ones, they they send messages to like spam uh, folders, and they send them or they just don't get them at all. And sometimes they hit or miss. I, I've had success with LinkedIn email, LinkedIn mail, but the people who really are handling business seem to want to move to over to email anyway. So because they can, you know, it's, it's a better environment for them and it's much more controllable. I have a secret hack for some of your listeners today, and I think Hannah uses this already. Love but that. There's this wonderful um, website called Hunter, H U N T E R dot I O, mm -hmm. and it's great because you can look up people's business email addresses on Hunter dot I O, and it'll verify it for you and give you a score of, oh, this is 85% accurate, or this is verified. There's also another one called mailscoop.com, but these are so great. And I, I'm with Hannah. I, I think email is the way to go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like I said, most people want you to move over to email and not depend on LinkedIn. Um, there might be some secret out there that LinkedIn isn't all that private messaging anyway here in the future. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, anybody else before I share mine? Uh, mine is, is uh, I sigh when I say this, but. I do want to talk about personal branding for a, just for a hot second, only because I, I have. <laughs> it's an overstated, um, but it's not particularly overemphasized as far as its useful no, usage. But I think many times there are things about personal branding where there's one aspect that's emphasized by personal branding experts. Um, and that is, and, and I got this revelation in reading um, uh, William Aruda's book, Digital You. And he's probably one of the few people who emphasize more about the deliverance of your personal branding, what you deliver, and not particularly the process. And I kind of use this analogy as that, you know, if a gymnast is just focused on doing somersaults and doing a great somersault, that doesn't mean that they're going to do the whole routine correctly or that they're going to be able to stick the landing. 
And a lot of times it, the personal branding is about being able to deliver, making a deliverable where it really does stick the landing. And, and to kind of bring this forward a little bit more is that you've got to be able to talk about to a degree what are results in working with you what are what are some things that are, are tangible and what, what am i going to get in working with you you can look at people's headlines and they're still nebulous they're still they, they still misfire if you will uh in, in the sense of they don't know how to uh put that into words and these days you've got to kind of know how to put it into words in order to for, for people to get it across because the competing uh, entities and competing your competition is going to find a way to communicate that if they don't do it in words then they're showing something that says this is how I deliver it and this is what people say about how I deliver it and this is what people are saying when I'm not in the room uh, about me delivering is that am I being clear about what I'm saying here yeah, if I could jump in, this really resonated because I wrote an article about in a similar vein to this. Mm -hmm. I approach branding through the lens of um, how you help others as literally being a pathway to figure out your, your personal brand. Mm -hmm. So how you help others and, and, and answer that question will help identify who you help. So there's a certain audience that you're helping. It could be your coworkers. If you have an internal, internal customers or clients, it could be external customers or clients, whether they be other companies or consumers. So who you help is part of your brand. Mm -hmm. How you help, uh, are you in operations or sales or marketing? So your job function is literally how you help others. And then finally, what results deliver, there's a result of you helping others. And so if you're consistently um, increasing sales or opening new markets or developing new products, that is the product of how you carry your function, how you help others. And so if you can walk through logically the different aspects of the help you offer, I find it's a really useful way um, to, to identify your brand and the unique flavor through which you help others. And so to your point about sticking the landing, the results is the proof, the evidence of how you help. And so if you can connect those dots, you know, from the audience, to the function, to the result, into how you help others, that's an awesome way to tell the story, you know, of what you do and to brand yourself in a way that should stand out versus other people, again, who are in the same function, but you do it differently. And that's what we're trying to focus Absolutely. On. And be able to communicate on not only on your all platforms online, but be able to communicate that in, in, in most people can do it in two sentences if they were really focused and no, nobody minds hearing two or three sentences about what you do and 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 even a little bit of how you do it and then uh or what people can expect mm -hmm. uh, that's really good communication sometimes it takes a long time for people to get there <laughs> and you're, you're we have laughing. very short attention spans right <laughs> so if you're yes. trying to have a conversation with somebody and five minutes later you're still explaining what you did yes. nobody cares <laughs> yeah and then and then to nobody you start to not believe them you start that kind of discredits you the longer you talk because then it says why are you going out of your way to explain this to me because either you're not confident in what you're doing you're not sure how it's coming across to me and do you really deliver it the way you say you are after five minutes you know <laughs> yeah if that's what you deliver it i don't want it <laughs> exactly you, you know that person's made decision to engage and disengage all in one spiel sarah any comments about it? you know i think personal branding you have to ask yourself to who are you what are you and you know to to Miyatu's point you also have to ask who your audience is and what does your audience care about but as a career coach there's there's a lot of other people delivering the same messages that I'm delivering and same with job seekers there's a lot of job seekers who have the same similar resumes who have the same similar backgrounds but what makes you different who, how does your story how's your story different than other people's stories i think about me individually and the message that i put out in content and the message that i deliver through my personal brand and that's you know i care deeply for people i'm really practical and i um i'm a straight shooter straight talker and so that's 
how I write my content, how I present myself online. And I think that that when you're trying to figure out your voice, ask yourself who you are and, and what makes you different. Absolutely. Um, uh, many times I think people are, um, well, I think we, we kind of hit it there, but I, I just think that I like to, I like to hear about what people feel about personal branding and where they're missing, but where I think I get off is where people start to talk more about the tricks and tips than they do about the more substantive parts of, of what they need to, and especially if you can, uh, especially when you can uh, customize it to each audience that you talk to, because everybody's different, everybody has a different understanding, and there's some people who have to start from ground zero, and can you detect that? And there's some people who are already at 90, you just want to take them to 100. So you'd be, you have to have the intelligence to be able to, to detect that. So that's good stuff there. Thank you very much. And finally, um, what job seekers can, can and can't do without in 2020 and beyond? Um, things that are just an absolute must. I mean, everything that we talked about are an absolute must, but maybe we, we can talk a little bit more about uh, what people can do without in 2020, especially if you think about the last three, four, five years where, you know, this one thing was emphasized and now it's not that big of a deal anymore. I'll start. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Um, I think that, I mean, we've, we've hit on having a targeted job search plan, but we really didn't talk about an achievement oriented resume. And mm. I, I am shocked when I look at a lot of MBA programs websites and see the resume samples that they're putting online. Mm -hmm. They're awful. <laughs> you know, like you have to have a modern resume that focuses on what you've accomplished, your results. Your resume does not need to look like a list of all the things that you've done in your job, like a job right. description. So you need to have a well-designed resume that's going to stand out in a stack. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And we got a show for that too, by the way. I'm going to be uh, going to spend some time with uh, Ashley Watkins coming up, uh, talk about resume trends for 2020. Uh, Nyatu, your, your take. Sure. Um, I would say uh, people. Um, you know, we hit upon it in different ways, um, but I just want to reemphasize the necessity and power of the networking um, and making sure that you have the right people in your corner to help you to get to where you're going to be. Much of what we discussed is how the ATS is, you know, it's a black hole and many job seekers don't need us to tell them that, but people still keep applying online. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for 2020, start building your network yesterday. Uh, the network you'll need when you're ready to make a move, you ideally should already have begun cultivating. And so, and, and just people to be a bit more expansive in their thinking of who the network is. Um, so for example, alumni, never forget about your alumni, not just school, but any group you've ever been a part of, your rec softball league, your kids, you know, uh, Saturday music class, those parents there. Um, and that's part of your network. If you're targeting a company, former employees of the company are still as valid, maybe sometimes even more valid than people currently work there because they'll be more candid in what mm -hmm. they share with you about what it's like to work at that company. So I would just encourage people to not to, to really focus in on people uh, in, in 2020 and then be as creative as they can in terms of who they reach out to and how they define you know, what their network is and who should be in it um, for 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Strategic work, networking. It's the best. Hannah. I love that answer. Like Absolutely. that's the best. Like, Cause it's all, I, you can do anything if you have a strong network, right? Anything. Right. You don't even need a resume if you've got a strong <laughs> network, but I still, I get you Sarah, right? <laughs> I'm sort of a, like an anti-resume person. I know I do. Um, here, here's my thing. And I've been saying this for a long time, but I still don't see it. And I think it really builds well off of what we were just talking about. I want everybody to have a great signature block in their email. 
How hard is that? It's one of the most important parts of marketing for your personal reputation, right? Mm -hmm. So does that email signature block include your first and last name, your telephone number, your email address, a link to your LinkedIn profile? Should. Yeah. Maybe if you want to include more, then sure, great. Include your your tagline or whatever. But that's the easiest thing people can do. And if they started including that in every email that they send from this point forward in 2020, to all those people that they're going to be networking with, imagine what impact that's going to have. People like to click on stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's even, um, unfortunately, still to, to 2020. And we've been talking about this for years now. Uh, <laughs> and it's amazing to me that people still uh, there's do no it. email, right? There's no email, and it's an easy way to be remembered, especially if you have a LinkedIn, uh, a LinkedIn, um, you know, uh, something to your profile or or to your website if you have one, uh, or a Twitter account that that is very helpful. But uh, here we are still talking about it. Uh, one of the things I think, uh, in, and I think I emphasize more than anything else, is that it's, it's time to start creating a demand for your work. Uh, the job search is way more competitive than the resume. It's way more competitive than, uh, you, you know, people are looking from all different angles uh, for talent, uh, for you. And me, and if you're not giving them, and people are not going to spend a lot of time doing it anymore, I think that's one of the behaviors I see from recruiters. They don't want to spend all that time looking, but they want the shortest route to success as possible. And that's one of the reasons why I think we have an ATS because, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. And resumes are not going to go anytime soon. I'm with you, Hannah. I'm, I'm, you know, resume can crinkle up and die. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reason why this one of the reasons why it's not going away because that's the easiest way to filter uh, lots of people applying to a job. So what you have to do is kind of put your resume in front of people combining everything that everybody talked about in the storytelling uh, format, network with people and draw them to your story online where you show your work and that you've created a demand for your work. And we're talking about just showing your best. We're not just talking about putting anything out there that people will get. Uh, I try my best in my LinkedIn profile, though I'm not looking for an employer, I am interested in, uh, uh, helping more people and uh, working with more people and having partnerships in that kind of way. But you can't do it if, if you don't have, if, if your profile is full of cliches and there are no keywords, uh, the grammar is terrible. <laughs> and we all know that that gets you absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. So being that we're going to have to go here in about three minutes, uh, starting with Sarah, then Hannah, and then Yatu. How can people get a hold of you? You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Sarah Johnston, or you can go to my website, www.briefcasecoach.com. Okay. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, wherever, Career Sherpa, Hannah Morgan. And um, I have a website, uh, careersherpa.net. There is a careersherpa.com. Don't go to that one. Yeah, don't go to that one. <laughs> go to .net. The, <laughs> go the authentic is .net. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can find me at aveneercareers.com. And I also uh, recently launched an Instagram account, also at Avenir Careers. So I'll be uh, you know, giving advice and then little, little tips and things like that. Yeah, I started, I started following you on Instagram. So oh, awesome. Really Thank really you. I appreciate it. <laughs> go in there now. All Sarah, right. are you going to say something? I was just saying, can you spell what you're saying? Because I'm, I'm having a hard oh, time. Oh, sure. So Avenir, A, V for Victor, E, N, I, R, careers.com. Awesome. Avenir, yeah. yeah. And, and everybody here blogs pretty regularly. Uh, so you can find the latest and greatest of job search tips. And of course, you know me, the voice of job .com. My name is Mark. And... Um, this is going to be split into two parts. 
Ooh. So it's going to be uh, 20 minutes one day and 20 minutes the uh, next week, the next year. So it's going to be airing twice. Once um, it's going to be published, the first part will be January, I want to say it's 12th. It's going to be on that Tuesday of that week. And then the next will be on the 26th, just so you all know. All right. In the meantime, thank you all for listening to the Voice of Job Seekers podcast, and you guys have a great week.